Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Colleen, for all the sharing. And uh, we praise God for all that he continues to do in each one of our lives. <clears throat> and as we continue to uh, progress in the Lord, we, we know that this is indeed the end time move. And most Christians, to a certain extent, realize that the church or the organized church is not where it should be. And something needs to happen to get the church perfected, to be where God wants the church to be. And even in the early days of ministry, when I was doing uh, uh, various uh, evangelism and uh, meetings and travel from various places, there's always been a knowing that despite all our best efforts, no one is successful in bringing the church to its perfection where we want it. Despite many actually wonderful men and women of God with all their flaws, trying to evangelize the world, trying to bring the world to the place where, and the church to the place where God wants it to be in its uh, optimum love for the Lord. And suddenly this uh, unexpected move of God comes upon us in 2012, together with the release of uh, the last part of the Seven Thunders message, which the Apostle John wrote, that uh, is, was hidden until our modern times. And then we realize we are in a seven times seven year moon towards the end time. And so here we are, we're past the first seven years, we're into the second of the se second set of seven years, and we're seeing the world taking its shape. And I use one of the angel's words when the angel was revealing to us what was happening. The angel regards these first three set of seven years as the alignment of the world, where countries said to be where they are, people have to be where they are, ready for God to bring this move about. We have seen how in the first set of seven years is like preparation. In the second set of seven years from 2020, 2027 are called the famine years. And indeed, at the beginning of, uh, actually began slowly in 2019, but it hit in its fullness from 2020 right up to this year, 2022. The whole world suddenly was affected by COVID 19. And this year, just as people are thinking about coming out from COVID and things returning to normal, suddenly in this year, there's a war of currency, there's a war between Russia and Ukraine. And for the first time in human history, the banking system has been weaponized. It has been so weaponized that Simple things like Visa and MasterCard also are forbidden. And when you weaponize systems, and they have also now weaponized sport. With, uh, within this week, they proclaim that just because you're from Russia, even if you're anti-war, you're also banned. The players that were banned uh, the number two was actually very vocal that he does not support the war, but he's still banned. So they have weaponized banking system, they have weaponized currency, they have weaponized sports, 
And what else is there to weaponize? On, um, so people like to paint the world in black and white. Now Russia is painted as black. Ukraine is painted as white. Of course, we know that there is um, a problem that is there. But the problem has been existing before this war. The Crimea problem and uh, uh, the two problems of the uh, Russian um, uh, population, uh, high, about a uh, high Russian population area in Ukraine has always been a problem since the breakdown of the Soviet Union, which is way back in time for us. We also know from our history and US history that when the US fought its war against England to be free from the UK and become an independent nation, that after that, they have their own civil war to establish their standards of uh, anti-slavery and freedom from slavery. And so each, each uh, country has its own e involvement. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes in the news, they're either pro this or pro that. And as a result, sometimes they don't realize that that within Ukraine before the president, modern president, there was also a lot of corruption. And today, most of the battles that are fought are sometimes fought not with the official Ukraine army, but by militias. And there is, and, and, and I look further, I realize that some of these militias will be ungovernable. And there's an interviewer who go to them now because now they're all anti-Russia. Anyone who's pro-Ukraine is welcome. And this reporter went to them. And then he realized these people who are fighting the Russians are just so people who love to fight. Some of them are ex-prisoners. Some of them are very violent people. And they just love a good fight. And... As he interviewed them, he asked them, why don't you become the official army of Ukraine instead of being a, a volunteer rebel group? And then they said they cannot fit in. And then they asked a question, after the war, what will you do? Uh, will you join the army? He says, no. So you can see that even if the war ends officially, they will be ungovernable because now they got weapons. Almost like in Syria, once the militias are formed, it's very hard to govern. And you can see that the old problem of corruption will come back. It is just like Iraq. The world sees the cruelty of Saddam Hussein and his sons against the people of Iraq. But behind it are not humans. Behind it are demons giving thoughts to people and sometimes possessing people that cause a cruelty. So after Saddam was defeated, when the U.S. soldiers took over the country, they themselves also began to display the same cruelty to prisoners of war. And they have their own trial. So you ask a question. Why is it that people keep repeating the violence of a place? It's because demons, fallen angels are ruling over certain areas. And if a place is violent, whether it be group A, group B, group C, as long as the demons are not exorcised, the demons will just get group A to, group A is defeated, you get group B to do the same thing group A did. And group C will do the same thing group B and group A does. People forgot to see the spiritual picture behind what's going on. And anyway, all these have been permitted by God, as I've shared before, so that the nations of UK, Germany, and France will rise in the midst of this war. But there are other things that I mentioned about the war on currency 
And for the first time, even Israel is now keeping some of its savings in Yuan. Do you know that is historically breaking? And a lot of countries are now turning to the Yuan, but they are not doing it happily. They are doing it unhappily. Because many countries look and say, if you can do that to weaponize a banking system against Russia, who is to say you won't do it against us? So now people and countries are very cautious. They are trying to put their eggs in more than one basket instead of just in US dollars. And as a result, it will cause the US dollar to keep falling. All the rise that you see are temporary rise because people have no choice. But if right now you have a strong currency of choice, people would take it. And there are strong currencies outside. And Israel, for the first time, has invested some of their savings in yuan, Chinese dollars, and in Australian dollars, and uh, in other currencies. This is a changing world right in front of our eyes without many people realizing what's going on. And when Russia began to value its uh, currency, where 5,000 rubles equals, I believe, a gram of gold, their currency suddenly started rising too, despite all the sanctions. The world is changing. Last year, it was COVID. Last two years, it was COVID, 2020-2021. Uh, we're into the third year of this, um, uh, if you count 2020, of this seven-year famine. This year, we see the war on money and currency, as we predicted from early this year. So all of us have to watch very carefully because it's a time when the world becomes more and more destabilized. Russia now has its own quote unquote visa system or master, they call it something else. China has its union pay. And the world is beginning to realize you cannot just use MasterCard or Visa card anymore. It is a changing world. And at the same time, the cryptocurrency battle against fiat currency is still going on. You see which currency at the end of this war on money, which will take place in this year, 2022 to 2023, in the end, there can only be one or two currencies that win. So it's a time for prayer and it's time for what we call watch and pray. Now, while all these things are going on, we know that the third set of seven years are war years. They'll be even more difficult to handle than this set of famine years. So please prepare yourselves. The tsunami is going to take place at, in the midst of the war years. And all that we see is only preparatory. I can see that even if the war ends now, there will be instability in Ukraine because of the militias. They are going to become ungovernable. You know how sometimes everyone can fight on the same side? But after the war, they become enemies. You see in the Second World War that communism was, uh, Russia was on the same side. Russia and China was the same side as the Allies. But immediately after the Second World War and with nuclear power coming in, the Cold War begins shortly after because Russia becomes an enemy and China was looked up as an enemy. And not too long ago, under the presidency of Trump, China was made an enemy. And people forgot to differentiate. 
that the government is different from the people. I'm sure there are a lot of good Russian people who are against the war, including tennis players. But when you don't differentiate between the government of a country and its people, it is a big philosophical flaw. A flaw that will cause wrong decisions to be made by political leaders. When we don't differentiate between the politics of a country and the people of the country who might not support the political system, then we are making a philosophical error, which will lead to policies and decisions that are destructive. And that is happening in front of our, our eyes. So what should we do in these end times? One of the things that God predicts about this end time move are several things. And of the many things, I would name the first foremost three things. This end time move before the coming of our Lord Jesus, which includes the rapture, will have tremendous signs and wonders. That is number one. This end time move before the coming of Jesus will be accompanied by number two, a great financial breakthrough for the people of God because there are Bible scriptures to fulfill like Isaiah 60 where the new Israel circumcised in the heart who experienced Isaiah 60. I have examined a lot of the prophecies of the end time that the Lord has shown. And in none of them, zero, none of them can Israel fulfill Isaiah 60 as a nation. There's no way it will ever happen. Because after the war, Israel might be neutral now, and you'll be surprised that Israel is very pro-Saudi Arabia because Saudi Arabia is the only country of the Arab that supports Israel's existence and independence as a, as a nation. So it's growing closer to Saudi Arabia, which might not be the best for it. But I can see after the tsunami period when Russia and China rule the world, that there will be a war between uh, Turkey and Greece. And in that time, Israel will also be dragged in. And so there will continue to be instability, even in the Middle East, until the Antichrist comes and brings a sort of pseudo-peace. Pseudo but there is Zero time at all when Israel will fulfill Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60 belongs to the church. In a tiny, small way, Israel will fulfill it during the fourth set of seven years when Egypt and Syria fulfill the Isaiah 19 prophecy. And that will take place about beginning, parts of it begin in the second, third set of seven years and the fourth set of seven years, which the angels are now preparing for. It's good to see the angels at work and the things that God is bringing forth. So number one, the end time move is accompanied by great signs and wonders. Number two, this end time move will be accompanied by great breakthroughs in the financial world and in the wealth and the God gives the church to establish uh, the visions of the white building that God has shown. Number three, this end time move will also mean the tearing down of denominational walls between true Christianity so that Jesus' prayer for the church to truly be one in John 17 takes place. So in this series on Sunday, we talk about biblical prosperity. And as we speak about biblical prosperity, 
I want to point to one more fact before I enter into the topic uh, in detail to continue on this series. Recently, God has been showing me another of his created beings called the galactic beings, for lack of a better word. We were the first to define things in the spirit because we need more vocabulary to describe some of the things God's revealing. And in the early days, all we know are angels, different type of angels. But I noticed that there are angels in charge of plants and in charge of um, mo uh, the molecular structure of matter. And for lack of a better word, I call them spirit beings. So we begin to understand their spirit beings and they're involved in signs and wonders, healing and miracles, especially when it has to do with the manipulation of molecules and atomic structure of created uh, matter. So we're angels and spirit beings. And of course, within each grouping, there are many, many subdivisions of spirit beings. Just the subdivisions of angels, archangels, and all that. But there's this other group that God actually tried to show. <clears throat> and God tried to show a lot of things, but um, the revelation and the instruments that God bring the revelations through fail in picking things up or picking things up inaccurately. And so uh, recently, uh, over this past month, God has been taking me into the area in the spirit and is out there in space to see the work of these galactic beings, for lack of a better word. What are galactic beings? Galactic beings are beings that are energizing the galaxy and under them are also beings that are energizing the planet Earth the sun, the moon, the stars, and every star behind every star is a created being energizing it. <clears throat> so all these are gathered together under these galactic beings. When God first created this universe, energy came forth from God. So visualize energy coming from God. And then the energy began to gather together in a place and then it began to circulate and then it goes on from there to other places. And so God began to create various areas. It is this galactic beings that gather the energy into pools and then within that, the angels and angels function uh, within those uh, created star systems or planets. So all these things are governed by galactic beings. But overall, <clears throat> and the reason why I'm sharing this is because it's tied to something very important that I call New Jerusalem. So God showed me that there are myriads and myriads of galactic beings of different sizes. And their role is to gather together matter and energy to form a galaxy, to form sun and stars. And um, so in one galaxy, there could be a trillion stars, there's a trillion other uh, smaller galactic beings under them. They can call solar beings, if you want to call them. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So these... Uh, Galactic beings and solar beings, uh, and there are star systems, and these beings are energizing. In science, they don't recognize beings behind matter. Science only recognizes the laws of physics. So they're inanimate laws as far as science is concerned. And the world has moved in its uh, philosophy to different extremes. At the beginning, 
when mankind first fell away from God, there's an understanding that behind every created being are other beings, life-giving beings. That was a basic philosophy. And those were the days when they understood that water, fire, earth, air, and all these are divisions among them. Do you notice how common it is, whether it be the Greek, uh, the Indians, the Chinese, or the various Western cultures in these long, long forgotten days that they believe in earth, fire, water, uh, air, and some got more, some got less. Uh, do you realize how common it is in the belief system of all cultures when you trace back to ancient times? It is because some of the understanding, a lot of it is all perverted now. Some of it came from the truth of understanding that all things are created by beings and uh, by God and the beings energized. But when man fell from, fell from, from God's righteousness and holiness into sin, that philosophical view became polluted. And man began to worship the stars, the moon, and, and trees, and rocks, and mountains. So man began to worship all those things, which was against God's law. And after that, man began to digress and became fearful. They are fearful of demons, fear, and call them gods, fearful of fallen angels, and they call them gods, fearful of created objects, and they begin to bow down to worship trees and mountains and rocks and creation of their hands and moon, the stars, the sun. They begin to become moon worshippers or sun worshippers. All that is against God's law. So everything became corrupted from their understanding. Then men moved to the opposite side, which is close to where we are in our modern era. Men don't believe in a God anymore. Men don't believe in uh, invisible creatures called demons or Satan or angels. They are the modern man stands in his own pride that he is the top of the food chain, the top of the evolution um, that took place and their intelligence has uh, brought them to some understanding and, and a philosophy without any invisible beings behind. Such that when you die, you become just dust. Everything is an accident of creation. The proteins, the molecules came together and we came from the bugs in the sea, and then we evolve, and then we move into the land, and then we develop lakes, started climbing trees, and then slowly evolve from that. So everything is a, is a quirk of uh, evolution, and, uh, and there's no such thing as a god, and no such thing as a, as a as a spirit being or angels or demons. So men went to the other side where they don't believe in any being behind objects. And in that pride, they say that everything is caused by the laws of physics. And everything is subject to that. And you and I know if the laws of physics exist, water cannot turn into wine. If the laws of physics exist, Jesus cannot walk on water. If the laws of physics exist, Jesus cannot resurrect from the dead. So you and I know that the laws of physics are subject to spiritual laws which are higher. And there's another way in which spiritual life sustains this physical life. All life is sustained by spiritual beings. Uh, and um, even we ourselves are spirit beings. We have a body. And it's our spirit that's sustaining our physical body. 
Now, when God was showing me these galactic beings and looking and trying to understand, I began to understand that their existence is all in a thought dimension. And then I saw that the seven heavens were like under the domain of galactic beings. And it flew along with the first to the seven heaven. And of course, ours is a reverse, where to us, the first heaven is what is in front of us, above us, then the second and third and the seventh heaven being the highest. But from God's perspective, where he is started first, that is where not number one. And so there was a galactic being and then the divisions of galactic things under our, our reality, which is for us a first heaven, but from heaven is like number seven, spirit of peace. And there are these galactic beings that are there. And altogether, I saw that there were 28 of them, that in the end, uh, each of the seven heaven has galactic beings. But what I saw, and the reason why God showed me that, was in what we call the seventh heaven, which is actually the spirit of peace, which is the first dimension from God's point, first dimension of heaven from God's point. There is one galactic being there. So primarily, I was drawn to two galactic beings. The one in our heaven above us and the one in the, what we call the seven heaven, the spirit of peace. And I saw that that was where New Jerusalem, if I can use these words, was being birthed, for lack of a better word. And that everything that happened in, in heaven, which we call the seventh heaven where God's throne is, there is a place inside God's throne. And God's whole throne and the whole existence of the seventh heaven is like one galactic being assigned to contain the energy there. Of course, there's the 24 elders and uh, four living creatures that have their role too. And the 24 elders are assigned to like foundational pillars that flow all the way down the seven heaven to our time into 24 spirit beings who control the 24 spiritual laws that govern the, the constituents of matter and energy. So I saw that in God, in the true room of God, that within the true room of God, if I can use these words, that everything that was happening on the earth, in the church, every, some things have already completed. The 12 apostles, the 12 patriarchs of Israel, who, have, who are both the gates and the foundation of New Jerusalem are completed. And the reason God showed me that is he was showing me that New Jerusalem was still being birthed within God, in God's dimension. And that who will be, which part of New Jerusalem is still being determined on the earth. And all the names that God gives us and him putting his name on our forehead is all part of the creation of New Jerusalem being completed. You know how the gestation period of a child in a mother's womb is about nine months for the humans? And in the nine months, if you observe any video or any uh, illustration of the growth, that the formation of it, the first formation within the fetus is the brain and the spinal cord. And then from there, 
there's a formation of the spinal cord, the limbs, the arms, the nerve system. And by the time the baby is ready to be birthed, you could see that it's a little tiny human being, complete with five fingers, five toes, uh, not 10 fingers, 10 toes, you come both hands, and two eyes, ears, and a nose, and a mouth. It's a complete human, except it's tiny. So I saw that within God, you could say, uh, with reverence to God, that there is, like, from the time Jesus went back into God in his resurrection, that the dimension of God was pregnant with New Jerusalem. And from 2,000 years ago, when Jesus went back, the galactic being which contained all of seven heaven holding it together, in the God dimension, they hold the energy because it has been created dimension. It was impregnated with this New Jerusalem. If you read New Jer about New Jerusalem, it comes out from, from God. Then it lands on the earth, which took place in, in New, and then it was like coinciding with the Feast of Tabernacles. They fulfill all the seven feasts that are predicting what God does, uh, the seven events of God from the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 to the Feast of Trumpets, which is our time, to the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, we already have the Feast of Pentecost. And, uh, so we have this feast that is events predicting about what is to take place. And I saw that New Jerusalem is being formed. But who will take part and be it, the part of New Jerusalem? Potentially, some of those who got into this move were potentially some of its pillars. I saw, God show me, their names taken away. And they will move to other parts. Hopefully, they don't fall off the scene. And God is looking for pillars different formation of parts of New Jerusalem. By the time New Jerusalem is birthed forth in New Heaven, New Earth, it is like the birthing of a special creation of God, the most special. It is like the whole universe now, with all its realities that we experience, in all the seven heaven, exists for the purpose, like for as a womb to bring forth new heaven, new earth, and especially new Jerusalem. With that in mind, may I remind each one of you, if you think that this move is only about your success on this planet Earth, you haven't got the eternal view yet. If you think that this move of God is all about the glorious church full stop, it is more than that. Your understanding of glory just need to expand. You think that this move of God is just to do God's will on this earth and be rewarded. You need to expand that. This move and who is where is, de is determined in New Jerusalem right now through our life decision and choices. Some people have potential. <clears throat> like Judas is carried potentially was one of the foundations. But his name was taken out and even blotted out of the book of life and replaced by the name of Titus, who became one of the twelve. So let's remember that this move is not just about this life. This move is about eternity. 
This move is about New Jerusalem. Where will you be in New Jerusalem? Is determined by your life and existence now. So we have to live this life completely, successfully, doing God's will. And allowing Jesus to transform us <clears throat> into the fullness of which part of New Jerusalem we will become. Once we're in New Jerusalem and you have a new earth, when New Jerusalem will come and land on this planet Earth, the planet Earth is just like a parking space for New Jerusalem. And God rearranged the planet Earth as a center of the new heaven, new Earth, where all the 28 galactic beings together with the 24 elders and all the seven angels of different degrees in charge over other angels in the seven heavens, together with the four living creatures are reorganized to reflect the perfection of perfection of Christ in new heaven, new earth. Today, we are all parts of the body of Christ. And what God wants to demonstrate in this end time is just a tiny little glimpse to the planet Earth who his church is. And who his church is is a something very important to God. The church which comprise those who look forward to Christ in the Old Testament and those who are in Christ in the New Testament have a holy covenant with God such that they will function together with Christ. After all, New Jerusalem is Mrs. Jesus and they will have a function in New Heaven, New Earth with the Trinity of God. And that will be the first time in all the existence of created beings that a group of created beings are taken and united in Christ so that they function together with the Trinity in governing the created New heaven, new earth of God. What a privilege that God has called us to. Now, in line with that, God is restoring different things. He's restoring us to the glory of Christ. He's restoring the works of Jesus and the greater works of Jesus in us. He's restoring the manifestation of the of Christ on the earth, but this time through us, his body. And together with that, he is also bringing forth the wealth that he predicts for this end time move. You have here that this end time move is the church coming out of the world into heaven. And we're taking that journey. Just like Israel coming out of Egypt to the land of Canaan. But the land of Canaan represents the fulfillment of the kingdom of God, which is demonstrated in this end time on earth and then continue in heaven above. And at the beginning, even before the Israel could even think and conceive of wealth. God told them in the book, if you have your Bible, in the book of Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, verse 22. 
Now, at this point, Moses has not even entered Egypt yet to ask Pharaoh to let God's people go. But God, in sending him out, said uh, to him, and this is a question that Moses asked in verse 13 of Exodus chapter 3. What is his name? The people will ask me, who is the God of Israel who has sent me to you? What shall I say to them? Verse 14, God says, I am who I am, which is Yahweh. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. In the old translation, they call the Yahweh as Jehovah. There is a romanization by English speakers. Today, we, more scholars want to be more accurate and they use the phrase Yahweh. Y-A-W-E-H, rather than Jehovah. But to those of you who are new in Christianity, uh, the problem is caused by scholars and theologians, not by you. Uh, the early scholars call Yahweh Jehovah, but the modern scholars want to keep it as close to Hebrew as possible, so we are now use the word Yahweh instead of Jehovah. So God says, I am, or Yahweh has sent me to you. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, verse 15, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial to all generations. I will surely visit you as God has promised. And then in the midst of talking about signs and wonders, say there are things that will take place. The people will go out as one. <clears throat> there will be signs and wonders. There will be tremendous prosperity. The three things that I say will take place. In this end time, we will leave Egypt, this world, because we're not of this world, as one. Number two, we will leave Egypt, this world, with signs and wonders. Number three, we will leave this world with the well of this world. And we will use that to establish places of worship, 24-hour worship to God. And also, we will part of sustaining 24-hour worship under the rapture. So all the resources of this planet Earth have been predestined for the church first. And after we are gone, then it's a different story. But as long as we are on this Earth, we are called to this glory. And God says in verse 20, So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt, with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst, after that he'll let you go. God will strike this planet with signs and wonders. And the people of God will believe God and come forth to be the glorious bride. God says in verse 21, I will give these people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of a neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, that you shall put them on your sons and your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. So we will. We will. Oh, the amount of wealth that God is bringing is... So great is beyond our imagination. All the wealth on the planet Earth is coming forth. The only question is, are we able to handle it? 
Are we able to manage it for God within the kingdom of God? You can see in a different way. God is establishing his kingdom. So he will bring all people to subject to Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's number one. Unite us all under him. One God, one Father, one Spirit, one body. And number two, because it's his kingdom, God will bring all the signs and wonders of establishing his kingdom. Even Jesus, when he started his ministry, he preached, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he did signs and wonders. And you remember when there are some people who doubt, good people, when John the Baptist was in prison and before he was beheaded, he asked his disciples to go and ask Jesus, are you the one? He said, why did John the Baptist ask him, are you the one? When he was the one who proclaimed, this is the one and God showed me. Because what you receive under the anointing and proclaim, all of us have our own inner theology. But let me read this part first before I took the passage of John. God promises and says, articles of silver, articles of gold, clothing, you shall plunder Egypt. So there's this wealth that is coming forth. Well, why did John the Baptist ask, are you the one? See, the problem is, God may use each one of us to proclaim. And many of people who have received visions, there are some on this planet who receive visions about the end time move. And they were once upon a time with us during the first seven years. But they do not believe their own vision. They begin to doubt their own visions. And some of the visions I've collected together from them. They know what this move is. They know their role in the move. And you know, when they are judged, they will be judged based on their visions first whether they believe their own visions. But the sad thing is, to be able to say this is the Christ, this is the end time move, this is that which God prophesied under the anointing, To begin the journey is different from finishing the journey. I'm sure that when Judas is carried, first join Jesus. He was okay. But somewhere in the middle of those three years, he started to have his own mind and concept. And of course, we can run him down because his motives were impure and he did not have a good heart. But even the disciples of Jesus have their own doubts about who Jesus was. And Jesus had to ask them in the third year, after nearly two plus years with him, he says, who do you say that I am? And it's Peter who says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. But after Jesus left, and rose on the day and left. Even after Jesus had told them he rise on the day, they all had their doubts. How many of them had doubts? All of them. 
let me show that all of them had doubts. When Jesus appeared to them, and uh, <clears throat> they saw Jesus in the book of Mark chapter 16. In Mark 16, it says that Jesus already began to appear to them in different ways. In verse 12, uh, let, let me start from Mark 16, uh, verse 11. When they heard the testimony of Mary Magdalene, the first to see Jesus, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they didn't believe. See that? They did not believe. Then in verse 12, when another two came, and there's a story in the 24, came and told them they met with Jesus, verse 13, they ran out and told it to the rest. But they did not believe them either. Then in verse 14, finally Jesus appeared to them. In verse 14, he appeared to the 11. As they sat at the table, he rebuilt them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Because they didn't believe others who told them that he has risen from the dead. Come on, you think Mary Magdalene was lying when she saw Jesus? You think the two disciples on the way to Emmaus in Luke 24 were lying when they say they saw Jesus? They were not. And here, Jesus said, why didn't you believe? At least you should start believing before I appear to you. And that's the same reason why you might believe at some point. Remember the four types of ground? There was one type of ground that believed at first. And then you don't have enough roots. So there are those who believe but don't have roots. That's why they cannot last long. Sometimes you think a person got roots, but they have no roots. John the Baptist had proclaimed that Jesus Christ is the Christ. But when he was in prison, he wondered, is Jesus really the one? See, just because you have a vision, a dream, an appearance of angels, a download, does not guarantee that you believe. You see, huh? Because believing is a choice we make. You have to choose to believe. And one of the things that prevent a person from believing is wrong thinking, wrong theology that prevent the heart from believing. Think about this way. What was the current theology when Jesus first came? The current theology of the end time when Jesus first came around 4 or 5 BC. Jesus born and then around 27 AD. Jesus began his ministry and they confronted him. The current theology was that when the Messiah come, he will set up a physical kingdom. <clears throat> and then he will make Israel great. <clears throat> he will reign like David. And he will make us the greatest nation of the world. That was their theology. So that even when Jesus was ascended on high in Acts chapter 1. They all were asking Jesus just before he went to heaven. They had spent, well, at least nearly 40 days and nights with him after his resurrection. And they asked Jesus, 
What about Israel? That question came from their theology. Their misunderstanding of why Jesus came. They could not see. In the end, they were told, don't worry about Israel. Because Israel was never a nation until 1948. Even at that time, in Jesus' time, they were like a tiny province under the Roman Empire. So everyone was wondering when Israel would become a great nation again. That was their theology. They were limited by the thinking of the people in their time. The same way today, we must not be limited by the thinking of the people of traditional Christianity of our time. We need to expand our thinking, not outside the Bible, but inside the Bible to see what God says our end time is. I want to repeat this tiny section, if you don't mind, because sometimes I need to emphasize some things. In the book of Daniel, chapter 2, it is obvious that there is a prophecy about the kingdom of God being established in our modern era. In chapter 2, verse 44, it says, In the days of these kings, there is the Tentos, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. If you read this prophecy carefully, it is talking about the Ten Toes, which is the end of the Roman Empire and the region of the Roman Empire having the Ten Toes. We were shown during the time of the Seven Thunders that on November 14, 2012, that the Ten Toes were like ten tigers. And the ten tigers attack a serpent. And then there were 20 dogs. We were shown again the ten tigers. Now we know these ten tigers, these ten toes, which are the ten horns in Daniel 7, chapter 7. They are the same thing. And these ten horns, the Lord told me, only exist after the Second World War. which is 1945. And after Israel was reorganized as a country in 1948. And the Lord reminded and said, that he said, in the generation that sees these things, that generation will not pass away until he comes again. So, 1948, a generation is 100 years to 2048. The Lord showed us exactly when the season of the rapture is. And in 2048, the Antichrist and the false prophet will visit Rome and be welcome there. Then subsequently later, in 2055, they will be welcomed into Israel, almost like, quote, unquote, the false Messiah. But to them, it will be like the Messiah. For they will have brought peace to the planet. We are living in this end time. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, they've been praying for our time. He says, Father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. He was getting thousands upon tens of thousands and millions to pray the Lord's prayer that will be fulfilled in our time. 
and the transfiguration was about the kingdom of God. It is mentioned, and I take Luke's account, in the Gospel of Luke, just as it was time for the transfiguration, he says in verse 27, but I tell you, there are some standing who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Eight days later, he showed them what the kingdom of God is like when he was transfigured. So the kingdom of God is coming on the earth in the days of the ten toes. This is the revival that God is bringing forth. In the book of Hebrews, Paul has been praying for these for so long. So then in Hebrews chapter 12, Paul says that we are coming to the mountain, but different mountain from Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was an allegory and type. We are Mount Zion. In verse 22, to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Not new Jerusalem yet, but the heavenly Jerusalem, which is coming to the earth because he says in verse 27, yet once more indicates the removal of those things. They are being shaken. He says, one more time God will shake this earth. It says, it was 26. Yet once more I will shake not the earth, but also in heaven. Yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. It's of things that are made that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. You see the word present tense, continuous tense. We are receiving a kingdom. Even Paul acknowledged that. The kingdom of God has begun in, his, in the church. And the kingdom of God, which is us, the church. Church equals kingdom of God. Not a tiny little kingdom of one denomination here, one denomination there. The church equals the kingdom of God where Jesus is Lord. The sheep doesn't belong to that denomination or that church. All the sheep belong to Jesus. You are members of an organization, of a denomination, this church, that church, the other church, the other church. But you belong to Jesus. No church or denomination can claim you as my sheep because only Jesus can say we are his sheep. And Paul realized we are receiving this kingdom. They have been prayed for. And finally, in our days, God is revealing in the, the kingdom of God is coming. Because whatever we is happening in our time has been prophesied from long ago. In Haggai chapter 2, it is mentioned here where God says unto each one of us about the times that we are living in. says here, and I read passage from chapter 2 of Haggai in verse 21. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, say, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots, those who ride in them, 
the horses and their riders shall come down, every one by sword of his brother. It is in the same context that he says in verse 6, yet once more I will shake the heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land. And God showed us in this end time book that this shaking will take place. I know the exact day and the exact year that this shaking will take place during the third set of seven years, which is the war years. A shaking that the world has never seen before. A.S. Rock was split in two for where the angel is. He was storm the earth and caused a shaking for it is time for the kingdom of God. Say, what about now? Now is beginning. Is the beginnings of the kingdom. And God especially told me in this second set of seven years, from the year 2022 onwards, get ready. The, another archangel is to join you. That is part of this end time. To complete the formation around this move. And I've been preparing myself. Now, as God mentions that in verse 6, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, even though I didn't know it yet. From the very beginning, when I was in traveling ministry, when I started the church, it was called Tabernacle of Glory. And then now when it came out and reestablish it, we are now Cathedral of Glory. It's always been about glory. God gave me the name before I fully understand. I will fill this temple with glory. And then the Lord says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says a lot of hosts. In this place, I will give peace, says a lot of hosts, the first of the seven spirits. So can you see the three things all being called to be one in Jesus, John 17, all being called to the time of signs and wonders, and all being called to the time of great prosperity which is part of this end time move. So today I talk about the prosperity being part of the end time move. Something beyond our understanding. Even before God sent Moses to Egypt, he already told them about the gold and silver that they will have. Even at the, before this move began, the Bible records about the end time move. When God established his kingdom, that he will cause this kingdom to have all the wealth of this earth. It is a part of prophecy beyond each one of us. But as we come to a conclusion, as we exercise faith in biblical prosperity, I would like to encourage your faith. In Mark chapter 11, whenever you exercise faith, there are always two things to deal with, tenses and senses. By tenses, I mean past tense, present tense, future tense. By senses, I mean what your eyes can see and touch. So when Jesus taught them how to have faith after the Withering of the fig tree, and the disciples asked him to help them understand his faith. Jesus says, 
have faith in God in Mark 11, 22. And it says, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatsoever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, notice present tense. When you ask, when you pray, believe that you received them. Past tense, all what you call perfect tense, uh, Aries tense, and you will have them, future tense. And so we see here that uh, Greek article here has various uh, tenses. And uh, let me get the one where they show the tenses uh, here. Okay. The logical dictionary, lexicon, no, lexicon, analytical lexicon. Yes. And in this particular uh, passage, they still let me bring out the Greek, analytical Greek. Uh, okay, let me bring out the Greek part of this uh, Bible, treasuries, commentaries, no, I want the Bible. And more, okay. Yes, Greek, where is my um, interlinear Greek Testament, there you go. And we are in Mark 11, this is verse 24. And the original Greek, uh, the Atutulego, who mean pata posa. And when you pray, when you believe, uh, when you pray and you ask, believe that you receive. Okay. It's um, um, in the passing present, active indicative, believe that you received and you will have them. There's a past tense. And uh, so he asked them to believe that they receive. So this is like already taken place. When you believe God in faith, you exercise faith, let's say for biblical prosperity, you must believe, you receive. And then between the point where you believe you receive, and let's call that point A, there's another point called you shall receive, point B, where it's still future thanks to you. What do you do between point A and point B is important. Between point A and point B, you must not depend on your senses, your five senses. Because faith is a substance of things so for the evidence of things not seen. The word not seen might as well be not felt, not visible. It's still invisible. All you have it is in your heart, not seen, not felt. So between point A and point B is your senses and your tenses that will destroy you. You must watch your tenses you already have received. You must watch your senses and know that what you have is in the invisible realm, and you're walking the walk of faith, believing that you have received until they manifest in your life. In the Bible, we have many stories. Between the time that Abraham believed that he has received a child in Genesis 15, to the time that he actually has a child in Genesis 17, God told him in 99, he'll have a child the next year. Uh, it's nearly about 20 odd years. He must believe he has received between point A and point B. Between the time that God anointed David to be king, around 1 Samuel 16 or so, to the time that David actually is king in 2 Samuel. 
was if David was about 15, that would be nearly 30 years before, uh, 15 years at the age of 30, before he became king over one tribe, tribe of Judah. And another seven and a half, seven years and, and, and six months before he became king over all Israel, which would make it, if he was 15, it was 15 plus uh, seven, nearly about 22 years from point A to point B. Between the time that Joseph was told that he would be the ruler over his brothers and with much authority, even his parents, will be higher than his parents, he was 17. When he stood before Pharaoh, he was 30. That is nearly 13 years from point A to point B. Between the time that God called Paul to the ministry, which is Acts 9. And Acts 9 is described in Acts 24 and Acts 26, where Paul makes it very clear that in Acts 26, in his testimony, that on the day of the Damascus experience, God recalled him to the ministry. To the point that Paul actually entered full-time ministry was in Acts 11 and then Acts 13, when he became an apostle. So Acts 11 is about 10 years after Acts 9. You add one more year, uh, that will be Acts 13. They have been about a year left. So there is a period between point A when God called Paul to be an apostle to Acts 13 when he actually became an apostle. There is always a point A to point B in our lives. You must never give up. Did Abraham give up? No. Even though sometimes he blundered into silent years. Did Joseph give up? Almost. But by the grace of God, he kept his hopes up. Faith is a substance of hope. Your hope must be strong. Did David give up? Many times nearly. And when Saul chased him twice, and he, uh, uh, he says, oh, no, I don't know when he's going to give, give this up. And then towards the end time, end of his day, just before he became king, he went and joined the Philistines. And they gave him a little town on Ziklag, which traditionally, although Philistine became part of the uh, gift to David as a town throughout all his life. There is a point A and point B in our life. Please don't be impatient. Many people think when I first came back to the ministry, uh, when in Singapore, people were thinking, oh, you know, it's going to be another mega church. But by the time God has refined me, I'm not interested in just mega church anymore. And then finally, I realized God was preparing me for this end time move because in 1997, after I left all the ministry and came to Australia, God gave me a dream vision about the end time move. And I remember it so clearly. It was one week before Jesus came. Now I knew that one week equals seven times seven. I've always been reserved for this end time move. And now we are part of the preparation in this end time. You never give up. From point A to point B. Now, point B is where everybody else can see because it's no more invisible. But now, a lot of things are invisible. But some things got to make visible to us just personally. All these beautiful, wonderful encounters with angels, galactic beings, and one thing I learned from the galactic beings is how the energy of their thoughts is what control and hold this universe together. Say, oh God, if humans have the same thought energy as these galactic beings, we would, we would be so powerful. And then the Lord says, he's preparing the Melchizedek priesthood, the bride of Christ, to be able to contain these kind of thoughts. 
I said, wow, we really need to grow. To have this kind of thoughts, they are so refined that the thought energy is moving planets and star systems around their orbits. What do we do between point A and point B? Keep your faith steady. Keep your faith steady. Number one, watch out for wavering. Because any wavering might diminish or cause you to fail to receive. Let me read some scriptures to you. In Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapter 4, it says of Abraham, the father of faith. He was 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. James chapter 1. It says there of this uh, wavering part. And let me see where to pick up uh, the reading in James chapter 1. Okay. In verse 6, James 1 verse 6, but let him ask in faith without doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Number one, between point A and point B, thou shall not waver. Number two, Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 11, says here in verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. I mean, he exists. There's a God who's watching every word, every action. There's a God who's keeping the time clock for us, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Number two, thou shall be diligent. You shall maintain the walk of faith and not go below the standard. You shall maintain what you've been doing and not go below. No matter how long it takes, you shall maintain your service to the Lord. You shall maintain your attendance to the service. You shall maintain your faithfulness. You shall maintain your first love. You shall be diligent until point B takes place. And number three, Hebrews chapter 13. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Therefore, by him, let us 
continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Between point A and point B, thou shall continually praise and give thanks to God until it manifests. So find a place, find a time, find a position. To number one, thou shalt not waver. Number two, thou shalt be diligent. Number three, thou shalt continually give praise and thanksgiving to God. Until you reach point B. Settle in your heart that that is what you will exist by. And you will successfully reach your point B. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you will cause all of us to know that prosperity is a part of this end time move. It's a part and parcel of something even before we were even born or exist. Because the Bible was written before we came into physical existence. It has been prophesied of us. We are here to fulfill prophecies uttered by prophets thousands of years ago. And what a privilege. We were born for this destiny. We were born for this purpose, to fulfill the word of God. Just as Jesus came to fulfill the word prophesied about him. We came to fulfill the word prophesied of us, to fulfill every word you have spoken. We thank you, Father. We bless you. We worship you. Let it be according to your word unto us. In Jesus' name. And Father, we thank you just to fulfill your word, you cause the whole Roman Empire to call a census so that Jesus of Nazareth can be born in Bethlehem, hometown of his parents. Just to fulfill your word, you brought me to Singapore and then out of it so that I can fulfill your word to be the man from the east who you call. So many things you do just because of your word. And your word of these end times was released to the church of Cathedral Glory in Singapore. And we are all over the world with Cathedral Glory Australia, Canada, and throughout every country of the world in Africa, Europe. South America, North America, and all of the Pacific Islands and Asia. You are fulfilling your word even before our eyes. You will go all the distance to ensure that every word written about us in this end time book is fulfilled. Let it be fulfilled in us. We are here to do your will, to fulfill the written word. We bless you and thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God, I pass the time to Colleen. And you can have your Q&A, and Colleen did mention any prayers that we might have. I'm going to get my cup of tea. All right, so... um... You can unmute yourself now uh, if you want to ask a question. And of course, I think later on, um, uh, we can uh, take your request for prayers. Or in fact, um, if you have prayers for uh, healing, uh, do uh, bring forth them as well. And uh, you can also post uh, in the chat.
Yeah, I think uh, we have to be careful about the way we use our mic uh, because uh, sometimes there was even interruptions to uh, pastors uh, preaching. So just be careful about that. Uh, yes, Paul, you have a question? Or a yes, hi, um, Elder Colin and greetings, Pastor and the fellow saints. Uh, Pastor, I have a question regarding um, these end times. Um what group of people is the church in the end time up against? Is it the politicians or the LBTG group? I mean, the LGBT group is very robust and intentional when they stand up and fight for something. Could the Antichrist preparing to form an allegiance with them? I mean, these people, for example, where I work, I, I work for a health insurance company. And so when they phone in, Pastor, they are very, they fight. They fight for their rights. They fight for their benefits. If you make any mistake, they can take you to court. And um, even in past experiences, past jobs, I've seen them that whatever opportunity they get, they want to go for leadership. They work hard. They make sure they go to the top. Um, so this is the kind of people whom when they fight, they, they fight tooth and nail. Uh, so my question is, uh, is the church up against such? I mean, if in the corporate world, we're experiencing such resistance, what more in the church? What more in the end times? So yeah, that's my question. All the outlines some of these things in his episode. And we will definitely face them in the same times. Paul mentioned in Second Timothy chapter three, verse one onwards, you shall notice that in the last days. The realest times will come. There's dangerous times. And these are the people that we will face. Like Colin has pointed out, and it is happening, and I warned about last year, I said, Christianity as a whole will go into disfavor, even in Christian countries. So that when you stand up as a righteous Christian, people will find fault with you and criticize you. It's not like long ago when Christianity is the fashion of the day. It's no more. If you believe in the Bible or believe the things of the Bible, you're regarded as old fashioned and you're regarded as someone very backwards. So being a Christian itself is going to be an opportunity for you to be persecuted. That is what Jesus is talking about, even in Matthew 24. But let's read Paul's writings. These are dangerous signs for men who will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. We really face a lot of unforgiving people, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despises of good. So they don't even like you when you do good. Traitors, headstrong, so there are many Judas Iscariots. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. From such people, Paul says, turn away. Doesn't matter if we got less and less of the world. It's better to be like Noah, like Enoch, than to have the rest of the world. So the answer is yes, my friend. We will face such things, but they are not the only group. There will be 
many, many different types of group. And all of them will have one thing in common, anti-Christian. There's another question here. In Africa, we hear a lot about pastors say we cannot fulfill God's will and the world of kingdom without money. How true is that? Because Jesus never said something like that. I think that's a wrong statement. I believe you can do God's work without money. And um, there are some people who live very simple lives, go to mission work, and all they live on is the agriculture. Whatever food they get, they get from there. They just live their lives very simply. So I don't know why pastors say that anyway. You know, let's not, let's not take what they say is unbiblical. However, God does and God will provide us an abundance. And um, we will have more than enough. And it's important to know we can serve God without money and we can serve God with lots of money. It's not a big thing in the equation of serving God. Uh, next question, are the Old Testament saints part of the body of Christ? The answer is yes. Are they also sons of God? I wouldn't regard them as sons of God yet, although after they died, they were the first batch resurrected in Jesus. Remember the first resurrection uh, of the Old Testament saints when Jesus rose from the dead. So let's keep the word sons of God to the New Testament for the moment. Hi, Pastor. How are you? Hi, Alisa. Um, I just want to say that I really do thank God for the, um, the word tonight. It was so dynamic. Um, I'm still like in awe. And, you know, I just want to say that I thank you, Pastor, because, you know, all of my life I've struggled spirit, um, spiritually because of my gifts. And, um, you know, I just want to say I thank God for you. And I thank God that I'm here. And I feel like that you're my spiritual father. And I just thank God for that. Um, because this wandering around in the wilderness is not a good thing to do. But so I just want to thank you for the word tonight and thank you for clarity and thank you that you're bringing this forward because God wants us to have more. Um, I've been hearing here lately that the Lord want me to be more type dimensional. And I'm so thankful that you brought forth about, you know, um, you know, the galactic angels and different things like that. But I want to ask you a couple of questions. I'm going to be real quick. My first question is, when you're talking about the galactic angels, that can mean a lot of different things. And um, I would like to know, is Metatron a galactic angel? Or, or when you say things like galactic and about the knowledge and the mind of where, you know, they would want us to be spiritually, are you talking about the Aetherians or who is the galactic? I mean, I just want to get more clarification about that because we don't want to get involved in things that are not of God, but is that like the Aetherians, the Palladians, the Ser are these are the beings that's trying to bring us here on earth up to higher level of knowledge and doing things like this. And I, I, I know that the galactic angels really work strongly in healing. When you work with the galactic angels, they can really assist a lot with healing. Um, so I just want to get more clarification about that because I know that God want me to be more dimensional. And it's like, I have to know this because at one time in my life, I was trying to take me into the multidimensional realms and different things like that, but I didn't know what it was. So I rebuked it. I said, Lord, please stop it. I don't know what, what this is, you know, because I'm going out into outer space and it happened in my consciousness. And I was running around out there and, and I saw a portal and I looked up and I saw, looked like a new earth. And I, and I went up there in my consciousness and, um, and it looked like everything was real sparkly. It was real beautiful. And, and that's getting to my next question. So the first question is about the galactics. The second question is if we were multidimensional and by us being multidimensional beings of what God wants to take us to, can we access the new earth and the new Jerusalem now back and forth or is it not available to us now? I don't know if okay. that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> so there are two questions. Yes. Uh, I will call them galactic angels. We are, angels are smaller than galactic beings. I call them galactic beings directly. Uh, galactic beings are not involved in healing and all this other stuff. Those are assigned to smaller angels. In fact, uh, even on Earth, the angels manifest each of their tasks. Like uh, 
the angel over the planet, Uriel Zael, is not so much involved in all the healings and all that. His task is to, to uh, energize the earth for good. And uh, there are other angels involved with warfare, with healing, with gifts and all that. So they are more the archangels of God. Among them uh, no, are different, different angels of God. And I'm just um, waiting on permission for them to review different things. But um, I'm allowed to review uh, the angel that started working with us in this move. The Bible names certain angels, like uh, Michael was named in the book of Daniel. Gabriel was also named in the book of Daniel. And then again in the New Testament, Gabriel is a name, and Michael is named again in the book of Revelation. And um, the other apocryphal books, uh, the extra books in the Catholic version of the Bible, uh, and the canon is uh, Angel Raphael. And uh, in the book of Enoch, of course, you got the most angels names ever mentioned, the book of Enoch, which is part of the canon of the Utopian church. And many of us in the New Testament, we only realize we've got 66 books. That's because we inherit the Protestant church and uh, the tradition of the Protestant church. The traditional Catholic church got extra books called the Maccabees uh, and the Song and all those things. Then the Ethiopian church, if we came from the Orthodox Ethiopian church, you will have the book of Enoch among the Bible. And so there are three main branches of the churches, uh, of uh, our modern churches today. Most of us came from the Protestant branch, which has 66 books. Nevertheless, to understand the angels, uh, our angel Uriel, who worked with us originally in this move, I've come to understand more and more who he is and what he is. When God created the seven heavens, he not only has the four living creatures and the galactic beings and the 24 elders, energy that go through all the seven heavens. But there are angels assigned. In the book, you know, you find sometimes seven angels' names are mentioned in one row. Sometimes four are mentioned because they are like the north, south, east, west position of the four living creatures. But when seven are mentioned, each of them are in charge over domains of the seven heavens. Our angel Uriel is actually known as the angel of peace in the book of Enoch, if any one of you read the book of Enoch, you will find that towards the end, he was talking to one main angel. And then he referred to this angel as the angel of peace. I just got permission. Uh, I mean, I work with angels all the time. I just got permission to mention who he is. And that's why I'm able to talk now on this. But angel Uriel is in charge of the first heaven here, which is number seven from God, but number one from our side. That is why he has worked with Noah and he has worked very closely with humankind. He is like the angel of peace. There's an angel in charge of, um, of uh, love and uh, all the seven heavens and then with joy and all those things. And Michael and Gabriel are among them. And Gabriel is in charge of uh, the seven heaven, including the, all those other things. And Michael in charge of different things. And each of them are in charge of different things. So uh, the galactic beings do not get involved in some of these things. They exist, they are huge. When you stand before them, you're like an atom before them. And they're huge in size. <clears throat> they are more like the foundational universe that hold the order of the planets and the star systems. And the only reason God revealed is because God was sh is showing that uh, many of us will learn some things from there. You know, we have to learn from all the creatures that God has made. So in the book of Revelation chapter 3, it says in verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, 
and I will write on him my new name. So we have to learn how to be pillars, stick fast, not just physically. You know, uh, one of the things that soldiers learn, when I was in uh, secondary school, uh, I took part in a lot of activities. And you know, it's part of your resume you try to build. I was a president of the chess club. I was um, a president of, I think, the science club. I was, uh, uh, I became the sergeant in the Red Cross Society and even also, I think, secretary in the literary and debating club and all those things. You participate. But it was with the Red Cross that I learned marching and, you know, salute and last time in Malaysia it was all in Malay so you will say you will say as you march you know and you learn how to march and turn around and uh, so uh, I became a uh, lens corporal then a corporal and they wanted to make me a sergeant and after they made me I said no I got too many things to do because there was going to be a lot of activity but you learn to give commands and you learn to give the command at the right time you got to watch which feet the people are marching in to give the command at the right time so they can use their feet to march and turn around or turn left or turn right. And you know, turn left is, and then you go left, and the other leg and you turn right. And so, do you notice that one of the things that soldiers learn to do is to stand still. And standing still is very hard for the physical body. If you stand too stiff, you will faint. You have to like learn to like once in a while move about and down a little bit to maintain that stillness for an hour or so when you're standing on attention. And uh, so it is, it is a skill in the spirit to have a thought that can stand steady, energized by God over a period of time. Many people's thoughts are very fleeting. To have a thought that you could sustain. And so from the galactic beings, I learned what it is like to be a pillar. Where you have a thought, but not your thought, but God's thought flowing through you. Many of you, I try to help you understand what it's like. It is like, You are not thinking, but the thought of God is flowing through you. It's like when you're praying in tongues in your mind, and it's another mind flowing through yours. So it's not your energy, but it's a skill that you develop. So I learned soul skills and spirit skills from the galactic beings. And so the first answer to the question is, no galactic beings do not get involved in simple things like healing. Even creative miracles are the domain, creative miracles are the domain of spirit beings. Uh, healing, signs, and wonders are part of the domain of angels. So each has distributed their own galactic beings and the domain of being a pillar. And a pillar in God's universal structure. And pillars in New Jerusalem. And pillars of the new heaven, new earth. In answer to the second question, do we access new heaven on earth? The answer is yes. We can access to some extent the powers of the age to come. So that's what we can access. Amen. Amen. Thank thank you, Pastor. Amen. Um, God bless you. Thank you. Next question we have. Uh, from Dufan, I passed about 10 years or more ago. God started telling me about the end time move of the Holy Spirit 10 years ago. Well, 10 years ago is when this move started. Uh, actually, the move began preparing itself on September 18, 2011. And then in January, February, September uh, uh, 2012, that was when uh, we... I went to the seven churches, and then that's how we encounter uh, the Pergamos glory. So not bad, the timing is about the same. It said, I had diverse encounters 
raising the day, uh, angelic assistant deliverance. But now I am confused as I have challenges in my health. I really don't know if I'm wavering or not, but one thing for sure, I love God, want to do His perfect will. Oh, there will be tests of faith that come and go. All you have to do is to remember what God said to you and be faithful to what God has asked you to be and to do. Uh, when God told me to go to Singapore, was in Singapore, and it's there that God brought forth the end time move to the Singapore church there. And now I'm in Queensland because God asked me to be in Queensland. And there's a few things God told me to do in this year and the next year. And I will share with a few people for prayer, but uh, that's it. And uh, I want, uh, everyone needs to know that God is still speaking. We are just being where God wants us to be. So just be faithful to where you are. Uh, my only question to you, Dufan, is number one, by now, do you have a meditation file? Something that you meditate daily in your life. If you have not, you got to get it together so that you can maintain your faith. Number two, do you have a book of visions, revelations that you keep? You have not. Be like a Daniel. Record them. Be like Zaya, who also recorded his visions. So from time to time, you can refer back to those visions and they will encourage you. Uh, and so that's how you keep maintaining uh, the faith. And usually, there are tests as we close, go closer and closer to point B. Closer to closer to point B, Joseph was in prison. And for two years after his greatest breakthrough he could have, with the butler, he was forgotten, but he didn't give up. David, just when he was close to becoming a king, he suffered the lowest point in his life at Ziglai. When a band of armed robbers stole everything they have, robbed the whole little village of Ziglai, including their wives and children. The men who were with him were so discouraged that they cried until they have no more strength to cry. I mean, these are soldiers crying. And they are so anguished that in their anger, they wanted to kill David. So there are high points and low points during point B to point, point A to point B. The thing is, when you live above the senses, that means everything in a sense dimension will not affect you. You keep yourself in a spiritual realm. You can go through hard times, easy times, low times, or high times. And that is a skill we must all learn from point A to point B. Um, oh, Pastor, I have another question. So um, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm finishing up the series on the presence of God. And I'd like to ask you, um, what, what do you think I should study next? Uh, because there's so much I do want to study um, in um, all, all of the teachings. But I would like to, you know, just get your recommendation of what you feel like that God would want me to study next. Okay. Alisa, you have been called to the dimension of worship. Your destiny is in worship. So I will encourage you to read as much as you can and to listen to all our past messages on worship. We have quite a lot of series on worship. Uh, there's a series I teach about worship following the seven fees, uh, different, different areas of worship. And the last series, as I think a year or two ago, when I thought about the book of Revelation, worship, and what they mean. So uh, go into those areas and you'll find that they will bless you very much. I feel like I want to cry right now because the Lord just keeps telling me that. And um, the Lord told me that I was going to be worshiping with the angels. And every time I worship, something happens. And I just thank God for you saying that because I know God always tell me that. And when I was reading about um, spiritual um, immunity, 
about the bulwark, about what you were saying. And the Lord told me that my stronghold is going to be my worship. And I thank God for that. That's going to be my stronghold is the worship in my life. And um, I just thank God for that. Amen. Thank you. Hello, Pastor. Hi. Hi, 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 Pastor. Yeah, I thought somebody was was speaking. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Pastor. Um, as far as the um, um the pillars are concerned, which is the galactic um beings, um, <laughs> is there like yes. a, a, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> but Pastor, is there like a specific number of human beings that? Um, are selected to grow into that because um, I'm trying to relate to what you're saying and I, I remember having um, an encounter some time back and it was as though um, there was a specific number of people that got selected that his life is going to be like poured into them before it's um, I guess um, uh, transmit into other um, beings and all that so I'm trying to relate to it to see if that's maybe what you're explaining now or that's a bit uh, different i would say yes um i like to rename the heaven as from the top down in the seven heaven which is at the top there is one main galactic being he contained it's like like it's like one galaxy there then in the second uh, in the sixth heaven there's like two beings two galactic beings, like two galaxies. And then the, the, in the physical, the biggest is the seven. In the seven, uh, in the first heaven, which is seven from the top in the universe of peace, there are seven galactic beings and under them are what we call uh, various uh, star systems and galaxy system beings. There are myriads of other galactic beings under them, solar beings, and uh, which are to do with the stars and groupings of solar beings which form galaxies. And for lack of better word, I call them galactic beings. Altogether, there are 28 main galactic beings. Uh, one in uh, one in seven heaven, two in six heaven, three in fifth heaven, down to us, which is about seven. And all 28 of them get rearranged in four directions with in New Heaven, New Earth, with New Jerusalem being in the center. And then they arrange themselves into uh, four directions uh, of seven. Seven times four, you get 28. And that's where, uh, that is like one plane. Then the other plane is the 24 elders, which is like, I can call it the vertical plane. And then in a vertical plane, the horizontal plane is the uh, galactic beings. The, the vertical plane is the uh, 24 elders, which goes through all of it. And uh, so these are the foundational structure uh, while the four living creatures are maintaining the energy, the worship, that, and the life of God that flow through them. Um, okay, so Pastor, whilst, whilst you're speaking, I was trying to um, um, also visualize them um, uh, in terms of the um, cube. Um, uh, Okay, uh, I, I think I think I think I'll pause here. But um, when I put my toes together, I'll, I'll get back. <laughs> okay, yeah. Remember, they are in a different plane of existence. So when I say that there are seven galactic beings in in our heaven for seven, uh, it means that there are seven folding of space and time and dimension. Uh, until the physical one which we are experiencing with our body at the moment. And so there are seven dimensional foldings to create our physical dimension. Hello, Pastor. Hello, praise the Lord. Amen. 
Um, first, I wanted to thank you for the teaching today. The anointing was so, so strong as you were teaching, and um, you continue to be an in incredible impact in all of our lives. Thank you very much, sir. Um, my first question is about uh, one of the steps you gave us when you said uh, not wavering. I wanted to ask if you could uh, expand a bit on that because I know you've also taught us that sometimes even Abraham wavered where, or I, I would use the word waver, but maybe you'll use another term when maybe God told him he was going to have a child and he laughed, but he never spoke it out. So is there a difference between, could you just clarify that so to give, get a better understanding of what you mean by wavering? Um, okay, I understand. Okay. In Romans chapter four, it says Abraham did not waver. But when you actually examine his life in the book of Genesis, it seems like he wavered, but the Lord told me his word is true. Abraham never wavered in his spirit, nor in his faith. Whatever things that we see to be wavering were not because he doubted God. So the Lord says to waver is to doubt and to enter into unbelief. And the Lord says, from the time that Abraham sacrificed and cut a covenant, he never, ever doubted. His reactions are reactions, but he never entered into unbelief. Even in the short moment when he laughed, the fact that it triggered a positive thing, a laugh rather than a moan or complain, it shows just the physical level, but he never spoke it out. And that's why God accepted that he did not waver. Then the other point was when he had a child through Ishmael, through Hagar. Abraham, in some manner, thought that perhaps this child could be the one. But it is because it's like the Israelite. They thought that Jesus is just a physical king when he's a spiritual king and a physical king eventually over the universe, which is much bigger. Jesus is like that, but the Israel see Jesus as that, like that. And um, so God sort of put up with us because he know how tiny creatures we are. Ants will always think like ants. So the ant must become human or enter into the thoughts of human to think like a human. Like, for example, when we are talking about great things and the seven thunders, I remember the night of the seven thunders, November 14, 2012. Sisters were quarreling about petty issues after that. When the fate of the universe was being announced, fate of the universe, you know how big the universe is? The earth is that big. Even the planet Jupiter is that big compared to the earth. And the planet Jupiter compared to the sun is that much compared to the sun. And the sun compared to other suns is that little compared to the normal big stars. And the sun, the biggest stars compared to the smallest galaxy is that little. And uh, the biggest of the galaxy compared to the universe is that tiny but So we have so many levels down tiny. And the fate of the universe is being spoken and two petty sisters quarrel. So the same way, that God puts up with our pettiness, things that affect our life. Can you imagine a person giving up their destiny for a red bean soup? 
is our did that. And a person giving up their destiny in New Jerusalem, just because they might disagree with a person or they think they don't look after the person anymore. So petty little things. And you know Judas is scary. You know why he want to betray Jesus? In a moment of anger because Jesus shoot him down when he was greedy for money and he want the money that the woman who, who bought the alabaster flask of perfume he wanted the money to be in his control. And Jesus said, why are you troubling this woman? The poor you always have, but me you don't always have. And he walked away in a huff and puff and anger. And that same night, he went to negotiate the betrayal of Jesus. Which later on, when his anger finished, he regretted. We humans are so petty. The smallest thing, the smallest anger, the smallest irritation, we will give up the universe. That's how fallen humans are. Our stomach, our uh, insecurities, our feeling of rejection, uh, our feeling of irritation, so tiny, will give up an eternity. That is amazing. And that is why God put up with Abraham in all his flaws. He told a lie when God asked him to go to Egypt, but God still blessed him with, with silver and gold and recognized him as a prophet. When he lied because he's afraid to die, when Abraham went with Hagar because he looks like you know, it's a long time since he has a child and he plotted with Sarah that maybe that's how he has a child. And that's very small thinking. God put up with it. God put up with it when he laughed uh, because now he's an old person and, and he cannot even produce anymore. He himself was thorough. And then God sort of teased him and said, you will call your child laughter. So God also has a sense of humor. He puts up with us. But the most important thing is, in the spirit, Abraham never wavered. To waver is to choose. His initial reaction are human. It's just like, um, uh, I will do my best, but if, if you wake me up at 4 a.m. when I'm in deep sleep and I have worked very hard, my first answer to you might be slightly, you know, uh, say, what are you doing waking me up? And then, you know, you get angry, you're upset at that. Uh, because uh, uh, I just got up, you know, from a very tired night. And um, so it's not like uh, you want me to be, uh, I would wish that I wake up at 4 a.m. and like Jesus, peace to you. And glory from God, you know. And the day will come when we become like that, when we are no more, when we get rid of uh, 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 the need to sleep, the need to eat, and all those things. Yes, we will be like that. But until then, God does put up with our limitations and our tiny fallacies of the human being. Hope that helps you for me. <laughs> yes, yes, it does, Pastor. And... Um... Thank you. Uh, it also shows God's graciousness towards us. Yes. My last question is from last week's uh, message. And uh, I've been running the model you gave us on the curves. I've been running yes. different characters of the Bible through that. And I got stuck with uh, Solomon. And mm. my question is, <laughs> did Solomon, is it that Solomon ever got to the point where his down curve happened? Because you told us there's a developmental stage, and I believe that accounts for when uh, he became king, was given riches, wisdom. Is it that the Bible does not record uh, his own down curve? Did he fall before the down curve? Or could you just uh, use Solomon to maybe buttress the point 
of the down curve. Thank you. Okay. Solomon was protected from the down curve. And if only he were allowed to experience more of the down, down curve, he would be better at handling well. Uh, how does a person get protected from the down curve? Whatever Solomon did to become king, he did it under the instruction of David. And I appreciate a rich people when they make their children go to normal school and live a normal life before they inherit their riches and their privilege. Because then they become more normal and appreciate what they had. Solomon was too protected and he has become an example. And he actually has a small down curve and a small up curve. So the additional riches he had were the up curve of David that he was flowing in. Sometimes, you know, like in science, two waves come together. So when a big wave and a small wave flow together, because, you know, all of us are rich and poor on the day we were born because of our parents. If your parents were rich, you'd be rich. If your parents were poor, you'd be poor. So we are already affected by the curve of our father. Like I say, the down curve and up curve is a very simplified version. You have to add the curve of our parents. So if the curve of our parents is a very high up curve, so your down curve is actually starting here. And let me try to illustrate. Let's say, uh, let me give a piece of paper on Solomon based on your question. Okay, this is Right. Okay, I can use this and let me get this. Uh, oops. I'm going to read on. The curves are a little bit more complex. And let you ask this question. Uh, because I'm sure other people uh, might ask the question, but they don't have opportunity to ask. Okay, let me do the curve. And David's down curve. David's up curve. Solomon's down curve. Okay. The red curve is Solomon. Can you see his curve didn't start here? Yeah. His curve started here. And that's why he couldn't, hand, couldn't handle the well. When he dropped, he dropped very low. So when you add the curve with your previous, although David did not physically experience as much wealth as Solomon, David's spiritual wealth, if you measure spiritually, David's spiritual wealth was very high, I would say. Very high. And just like Jesus told the church of uh, Smyrna, they are poor, but they are rich. And he told the Laodicean church, you're rich, but you're poor. So David was the richest of all the Israelite kings when you add spirit and physical. Solomon was only the richest physically, but Solomon's spirit was very poor, very, very low in development. And so that is why Solomon looked like a tiny little picture. And look at today, 
You know the value of your life is after you die and go to heaven. Whatever value you think you have now, you measure it on human being and, and this planet is a wrong measurement. Right now in heaven, who are the main teachers who got sent to this planet? Moses, Elijah, you know. Has Solomon been sent to help anyone on the earth? No. David, to some extent. So the value of a person's life is not the value you have on earth. It's the value you have after your life is finished. Then there's the measurement. And all of us, when you face Jesus at the judgment day for reward, it is what value you have after you die. Whatever developments you have in your life, whatever victories you have, you have accomplished on the earth spiritually. So Solomon was tiny worm compared to King David. Thank you, Pastor. That brings up more questions, but I'll leave the floor for <laughs> others. Maybe at the end, <laughs> I may ask yeah. them if there's more time. Thank you, sure. Pastor. Oh, there's a question here. Let me look at that. Um, did Jacob get to have a sense of what could have happened to his son, Joseph? But well, Joseph was in Egypt. Uh, since that's a question, I would say no. Because Jacob was too naturalized also. You know, when people are only concerned about the natural, they will not receive much spiritual thing. Next question. Was the Joseph experience another test in his elderly life? Did he feel like he was being punished after suffering under late? Not, not Joseph, you're talking about Jacob. So, okay. Uh, Joseph never was under labor. Uh, what Jacob explained that test in his elderly life, did he feel like he was being punished after suffering under Laban, running away from his brother and losing his wife, Rachel. How painful could he have been for Jacob? Because this looks like another dunker for him. Okay. Don't forget, if you measure the age of Jacob, by the time he ran away, He's actually could be in his 80s, 90s. Based on our standards today, we will call it elderly. But yet he went on to uh, went on to have another seven plus seven years plus six. So altogether uh, 20 years under Laban. And I would say that Jacob has several down curves. Uh, when he was supposed to marry, he had, a, he had a down curve at the end of seven years because he was a shock. Jacob gave the wrong daughter purposefully. Then he had to serve another seven years, so he went through. Then he had a hard time doing his six years working for the animals. It was all down, down curve. And um, so when Laban was chasing him, God angel stopped Laban. Remember Laban talked about the angel appearing to him. He said, don't say any evil or good, you just be neutral. And if, because the angel knows he cannot be, cannot be good, so they at least be neutral. And, uh, and they don't want any good to come out of Laban because Laban is an idol worshipper. And so Jacob did not expect that his wife would die. His wife didn't die because of his, of the, of the uh, predestination. His wife died because of his curse that he spoke. To whoever stole the idols, let the person die. So that cursed his own wife and his wife died. And so he was deprived of the only wife that he loved. And uh, so that would be, I would say, a disaster experience by the, you know, down curves and up curves are predestination. But within them, based on our own fault, I believe Judas Iscariot will have his down curve and his up curve. But Judas Iscariot forfeited his up curve by betraying Jesus, and he just dropped straight down. Pew! No more curve. Some people are like that. They just drop. Pew! No curve at all. Because of the actions and consequences of their actions. So I believe 
Jacob almost dropped, but by the grace of God, he still continued. Due to the decisions of people, their up curve or down curve is affected by their own decision or make worse. Uh, next question. Pastor, I worship with flags. I remember back 2011, worship my flags, with flags. It's okay to use flags. Um, uh, it's okay. It's just an expression that uh, you for you to use. And so no problem with that. Uh, next thing, so I have a vision seeing an ancient man holding a staff and he said, a new cycle is starting, the cycle of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, please, I need to understand of this cycle of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Um, this move of God is like the cycle of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. God will choose people who are like Abraham, people who are like Isaac, people who are like Jacob, but not in the worst way, to bring out the expression of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this move is bringing forth the Trinity because we have the time of the Father revealing from a distance. Then we have the time of Jesus when he revealed himself. Now we have the Holy Spirit. But in the end time, you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's what it means. Hi, Pastor. Hi, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pastor, I just want to ask, um, continuing from Pastor Elijah's question about these galactic, be galactic beings. Galactic beings, yeah. Yes. So if you don't mind, Elder Colin, do you mind to let me share my screen, please? So that everyone may benefit from it. Oh, you can share. Uh, there's no restriction. Uh, it says here only the host can share in this meeting. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry, taking your time. All right, it's no problem. Please okay, try. so yeah, so um, sharing from my screen. From this old teaching, uh, not old teaching, 2020 from the Cube Revelation. Uh, if anybody interested can go to 2020 Cube Revelation, Cube Understanding. When you click the PDF, this one. So this galactic being, Pastor, remember this graph you made? Yeah, this is a cube. Yeah, the God Cube, Universe Cube, Earth Cube. So it was... Um, trying to also like to visualize it in my mind well pastor elijah asking it so this galactic being it's is it here in the universe cube right outside of the created realm oh the galactic beings are in all three cubes so meaning the to third say cube is not revealed yet so, so it's in, it, the, in the universe cube now mm -hmm. you treat the first cube which is the earth as inside the universe cube. Mm -hmm. So the galactic beings are in the universe cube, which is the middle one. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the universe cube, the universe is divided into seven heavens. Yeah, so it, so, so this, it's like a different dimension. This cube a di is like a vertical picture. Mm -hmm. the, the galactic beings are like the horizontal picture. So which is really contained cute. inside the universe cube. See, how okay. do we illustrate seven heavens in the universe cube? It's another. Mm -hmm. You can put it this way and show it another, another dimension. Okay, so, so yeah. So that at least now we know that oh, this galactic being belongs to which cube? It's under the, it's three cubes. In the universe cube. And they will become cube. part of the third cube. All seven, all seven times four will be in the unit cube, but arranged differently. So okay. now the arrangement is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. With the, with the biggest section in our heaven, which we are part of now. Okay. And it's a seven folding dimension. So how we we'll look, we we'll look forward to that, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. 
Praise God. Also, may I ask if anyone needs any prayer, like Colin says. And uh, for my sensing, it's like most of you are okay exercising your authority in healing and in prayer, which is good. Okay, there's an addition to this question on the cycle. Uh, the new cycle already began in 2012. How do you partake in a move or cycle? By being part of the end time move and, and preparing yourself in this end time move. And the messages we teach are helping each one to prepare. So, Pastor, maybe at this point in time, we, uh, we, we can pray in the Spirit for a few minutes and then um, we can ask people uh, if, they, if they have a need to lay hands on themselves or you want them also to indicate, let's say, in the... Okay. Uh, uh, let's say, like, you know, the, they can put a tick or uh, whatever in the... Uh, what kind of reactions, right? Okay, I think we can minister as a whole. Uh, yeah, minister as a whole. Okay. And let me describe. I'm waiting on a lot to show. Okay. Uh, now I get into the healing anointing. And in healing, I'm scanning all of you right now. Okay. Uh, this one is a lady. Growth, some sort of lump that you find, heart lump under your armpit. And, okay, an ankle problem belonging to a young man, N right knee, uh, not in the something sometime back ago, 38 year old person with a problem here in the back of your neck. Uh, Yeah, about 56. You have some area with urination problems. Your kidney is not functioning the way it should. You get up in the night and you got way short bladder controls. God wants to heal you to die. Uh, okay. This one. Is one of you in Africa? I see like a heart, and I see this African man, and you have a murmuring of the heart. Okay. Several of you got stomach problems. One of you especially finding it hard in digestion. Uh, just picking up, sorry. Okay, the Holy Spirit reminded me some of the things I pick up belong to your family. And one of you have occasional problem on your right side that you always suspect to be your appendix. And it is, but God has touched you and healed you. So you need to maintain. Because some people ask, how do I maintain healing of the appendix? The Lord has showed me. Uh, you need to have probiotics in your life. The appendix was designed originally for producing fermentation and uh, friendly bacteria for the digestive system. But through the many years of sin nature and the fall of man, uh, the organ has been reduced until it's just a tiny little uh, thing that is, doesn't seem to have any use. But uh, it originally helps in the formation of friendly bacteria. So all you have to do is increase your probiotics and you will avoid uh, appendicitis. Uh, okay. Uh, there could be several more. Uh, there are some of the things I got showed, which I can't say out. As you know, they are more in the intimate parts of your body got on the touch. But let's bring the spirit right now. And wherever you are, just uh, lay your hands on that part of your body in the healing or, uh, or just generally on your head, you feel that easier. 
ikbra haşi erik manna kuru başlara mahangi biriki 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 bara baş do madiki biriki 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 mantanta da batak para and I encourage uh, the three plants uh, uh, Elijah and Abraham to also unveil together with colleagues and to pray along with me Rabo hashi gibidi gibaha shatara bohonga braba stiki mereke bidi gibidi gibidi ganga braba le gibidi gibidi gashta yukuru ushin mega braham masene gibidi 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 ganga brahma ze gibidi tumara bale ke bidi gibidi kpa allah brahmane ge mere ge bidi gibidi gibidi bro boshara mane ke bidi gibidi ganga brahma le ke bidi gibidi ke bosh tumara bas tumara le ge be egin be inge one of you ladies in your 40s you have very coarse veins in your legs that go with touch and heal me right those of you got no problem no sicknesses lay your hands upon your head receive the help and measure of help that God gives to you Parting and strengthening your gifts also, strengthening your gift of vision, strengthening your gift of dreams. Strengthening your inner eyes. The Bala 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 Ki Biri 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 Rebere Rebere Rambedebekan <laughs> Oh, Father who are in heaven, we release a wave of healing over your people. Those who are here, those who are hearing your word who are not here, there's a man, you're not here yet, but you're going to listen to this message. 
on your right lung has given problems, your breathing difficulties at night when you sleep, be healed. For in God there's no time, healing is yours. Whatever all those are hearing this word, wherever you are, reach out, touch your head or any part of your body. And right now, as you release a wave of healing anointing, receive. Thank you, Father God, for all your grace and mercy that you established in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. And uh, Colleen, any concluding words before uh, we close? Uh, no, Pastor, I think today we have a good session. Uh, praise the Lord. Um, yes, and indeed, uh, let's everyone continue to um, walk in the perfection of uh, spirit, soul, and uh, body. And uh, indeed, uh, we look forward to the next session together. Amen. Amen. Let's sing uh, the doxology. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. God bless each one of you. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Pastor. Bless everyone. Thank you, Thank Pastor. You, Pastor. God, bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Bye. 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 Bye.